Well, now for that introduction. No, I'm not digging a hole. This, anybody, this is a shovel. It's a very worn shovel. Oh, thank you. I was at a garage sale looking for tools, and I saw this shovel, and I asked the guy how much. He said, you can take it because it's old. And since I'm old, I took it. So I said, thank you. And I wonder how many holes this shovel has dug and how many has it filled. And I wonder how old it is. And that brings us to our message about shovels. Do you know shovels are in the Bible? The Egyptians had shovels. And when children of Israel left Egypt, they took their shovels with them. Did you know that? How to, two months after leaving Egypt, God gives them a command. Deuteronomy 23, 11, God said, When you go to war against your enemies, be sure to stay away from anything that is impure. And that's a sermon in itself. Three points, which I'm not going to preach it. When you go to war, not F, you are in a war whether you like it or not. And the war is for your soul. So you're going to either fight the battle or you're going to get beat up, okay? And fighting the battle, you may lose the battle, but you're going to win the war. That's the bottom line. So when you go to war, not F, and it is a war against your enemies, not your friends. Don't fight with other believers. There's enough people out there to fight with. If you have aught against your brother, go to them in private and discuss it and try to resolve it. If you can't resolve it, take somebody else with you who's a neutral party who will not take one side or the other. Both of you share your point. Let him make the decision and you accept what he says. And if that doesn't work, take it for the whole church. I'd like to have a church meeting call where we all gather to discuss an issue between two believers. We don't do that anymore, but that's what they used to do. So don't fight your friends. And as you fight, stay away from anything that is impure. Impure means anything you touch that can contaminate you. So fight a battle against your enemy, not your friends. And when you fight, only fight with the things that God gives you to fight with. Don't fight with the tools, the weapons the enemy has. If the devil comes along and calls you stupid and you call him stupid back, he won. Because you use the same language he used. So you don't do that. You just say, the Lord rebuke you. I ain't got time for you. Get out of my way. So in verse 13 of that same chapter, he says, you shall have a shovel among your weapons. This was a weapon that they were supposed to use. Okay? And the reason is not what you think. And I'm going to use modern terminology. Deuteronomy 23, 13, you don't even know it's in the Bible. You shall go outside the camp, and when you have to go to number two, you shall have a shovel among your weapons. And when you sit down to relieve yourself, you shall dig a hole with your shovel and cover it up what has come out of you. Did you know it's in the Bible? Huh? Deuteronomy 23, 13. Look it up in a modern translation. Okay? And why? The reason is not what you think. He goes on to say, why? Verse 14, he says, If I see it, I will turn away from you. And your enemies, your enemies will be allowed to come into your camp. Okay, that's another sermon itself. I got about 10 sermons here. Okay, so if you're a person that uses a certain four letter word that people use to relieve themselves in time of danger, danger, frustration, other various negative emotions, stop using it because God doesn't want to see it and God doesn't want to hear it. Okay, nine months later, the children of Israel, the shovel comes up again. They're at Mount Sinai. God says to Moses, 
I want you to build the tabernacle so I can dwell in it. He also gave Moses instructions on what to put in it. One item was a bronze altar, and bronze stands for God's righteous judgment. Daily at the altar, the priest was to pray, praise, worship, and make atonement for sins. We prayed this morning. I went into the prayer room. I had the, those that were still in there pray for me. Uh, we worshiped this morning. We came forward to make atonement for our sins and rededicate ourselves. The atonement would begin when the person who sinned would bring either an ox, a cattle, a sheep, a goat, or a dove to be sacrificed. The priest would take the sacrifice, drain the blood, carry the blood and the animal inside the tabernacle. He would skin the animal, cut it up in pieces. The skin would be thrown away. The pieces would be burnt on the altar. This is where the shovel comes in. God knew that the ashes, if they were not swept up and scooped up, they would build up. So the pile would get deeper and deeper, making it harder and harder for the priest to make the sacrifice. So God knew that if it stayed, if the ashes continued to build up, they would eventually cover the altar. So God said, I want you to make a bronze bucket and a bronze shovel. By the way, about, they found a bronze shovel. They were, in Israel, it was a very interesting land. They were digging those archaeological sites, and they found a bronze shovel. Very interesting. It had a, its handle was a duck, neck, and a head. Very interesting. I wonder what that shovel was used for. But bronze apparently doesn't decay in that type of climate. So, and what you're supposed to do is, you take the shovel, and you scoop up the ashes, and put them in the bucket. And then, you, for that, you swept all the ashes off the altar. You swept them up in a pile. That's when you scooped them up. Okay? And they were specifically to be carried outside the camp to a clean place. Exodus 27.3. They would be used, again, under certain circumstances in purification rituals. They would be used to wash people who were unclean. How would you like to be washed with a bunch of ashes? By the way, charcoal is very good if you're poisoned, you know. Eat some charcoal, okay? There's a lot of municipal purpose in ashes. Am I correct? I'm not a doctor, so be careful what I say, okay? Biblically, ashes symbolize the residue of past painful experiences. To cover yourself with ashes meant you recognize that you have done something that displeases the Lord and it grieves you and you are repenting. So that's why you, that, so if you saw somebody in that time in history who were covered with ashes, that was a symbol that they, they committed a sin and they're grieving over it and they're repenting. So don't, I don't, Go by Ash Wednesday, but don't attack it because there's a basis for that, okay? It's, it has to do with repentance. Job said, I repent in dust cloth and ashes, Job 42, 6. By doing this, he showed to those around him that he was grieved over the sin that he committed and he was repenting. And if you want to know what that sin was, it's a very interesting sin. It's another sermon. He says in 42.3, I have declared things about God that I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. How many people stand up and declare things about God and they have no knowledge what they're talking about? Okay, nothing. You've got you to know what you are talking about when you declare the word of God because you can do a lot of damage to people by saying something about God that's not the truth. In the last few weeks, I've had two people approach me who, who somebody has said something to them about God, and they asked me what I thought about it, and I said, reject it. It's not from God. 
God is not, God does not do what people think he does. So Job, if you read the book of Job, said all these things about God, and the very end he says, I didn't know what I was talking about, so I repent, God, in dust, cloths, and ashes. I grieve, he says, over the fact that I told these three guys, four guys actually, things about you that weren't true. And I'm sorry for it, and I repent of it. There's a New Testament parallel. The New Testament altar is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you are that temple. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. By the way, Wednesday night I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, just a little put in there. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. See, if allowed to remain, if ashes in your life, which represent past painful experiences, if they're allowed to remain, it becomes hard to pray, to praise the Lord, to worship, and to intercede for other people. Just as the Old Testament Levites had a daily task of taking the shovel, scooping up the asses, putting them in the bucket, carrying the bucket outside the camp, so we, according to Hebrews 13, 13 through 15, let us go outside the camp, bearing his reproach, for here we do have not have a lasting city, but we are seeking a city which is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name. Ash memories are very destructive. We're going to talk about some of those in a few minutes. So if you have ash memories, they become the servant of despondency. So my suggestion is you, you fire the servant. Okay? Now another point. Going back to Deuteronomy 23. The children of Israel used a shovel to dig a hole and to fill a hole. So you dug the hole. You did what you normally do. And then you fill the hole back up. So that when God comes over, he doesn't see what you got rid of. Okay? He doesn't do that. Now, God has a shovel, the devil has a shovel, everybody has a shovel, which means you have a shovel. Now, God takes his shovel and he digs a hole in the part of a newborn spirit. He digs a hole that he wants to fill with his love. For we know God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But each person has to allow God to fill their hole. You do that by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You probably came forward this morning maybe because you got a hole. It, to encourage people to make a decision for God, God did this. God planted, according to Ecclesiastes 3.11, God planted eternity in men's hearts and minds, a divinely implanted sense of a purpose working through the ages with nothing under the sun, but God alone can satisfy. Ecclesiastes 3.11. There's a book I have which I haven't read in years, but I still remember. It's called Eternity in Their Hearts. It talks about all these people around the world who have a longing for God, and it's fantastic stories about missionaries back in the 17, 1800s, that time period, would go overseas and they'd go into some of these jungles and they'd find these people that instantly accepted the Lord because they had to turn their heart and they knew there was something there that was missing. The Hawaiian people is the only culture that cast aside all their idols just before the first missionaries landed. There was a religious void, and they, they came to Christ by the thousands. It's a fantastic story 
of the revival that occurred in Hawaii. The town of Hilo that we live, live next to actually became a town because of a missionary named Titus Cohen who walked around the island and preaching. And as he did, with the, he felt the fire of God in his bones and people began to follow him. And by the time he got back to where Hilo was, which is a small little village, there were like 10,000, 15,000 people that had followed him to build the town. It, became, it, it, there, it was a town for a time period where there's no crime. Sailing ships of whalers, who were not Navy guys, didn't want to land there because there was no bars and nothing, nothing else going on. So they didn't want to land there. And Titus Cohen, when he died, he said he was sad and he said God was not able to do what he really wanted to do on, the, on Hilo. Just an amazing story. Okay? But people have eternity in their hearts. So God takes a shovel and he digs a hole in everybody's heart and they have a desire to live forever and eternity and the only way they can find that desire satisfied is through coming to Jesus Christ. Satan uses a shovel to dig pits for us to fall into. Then he seeks to bury you in it. So he takes a shovel, digs a pit, seeks to bury you. Remember the movie The Princess Bride? The, the pit of despair. <laughs> we had a guy in our church in Hilo that looked like the guy that said it and even sounded like it. Remember? Okay, aloha. Yeah. He actually looked and sounded like it. He could say it like the guy in the movie said it. The pit of despair. And he tries to push you in it. He uses guilt, hurt, betrayal, pain, sickness, loss, Anything he, anything he can to push you into that pit. So how do you stay out of the pit of despair? You take away the devil's shovel. Okay, man. How do you do that? You allow God to take away his shovel and fill the pit before you get thrown in. So the devil digs the pit. He tries to throw you in it. But... Because you're a child of God, and if you follow what God wants, God will come along and fill that pit up before you get there, and you just walk right over it. So don't let the devil, don't let pain or guilt or hurt or the loss of someone cause you to jump in the hole that the devil dug for you. Now, everyone else has, everybody has a shovel. I'm going to talk about evil people. Evil people use the shovel to dig a pit for others to fall into. And this is something we need to keep in mind, okay? <clears throat> when evil comes against you, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That is a scripture. Isaiah 53, I think, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Doesn't mean it won't come. It just means it won't prosper. And you also have other promises that come along with that. Okay? There's a lot of them, but i got a couple of them here. Psalms 7, 14 through 16 and Psalms 30, verse 3. If an evil person digs a pit to trap you, don't worry because they'll fall in the pit, not you. And any trouble that be, that be any, any trouble they cause you will backfire on them as I said, because no weapon formed against you shall prosper. They plan that they made against you will fall onto their heads. I think the best example, my wife and I have been talking about that, is Esther. You got Mordecai and, what, Haman? Yep. The guy was ecstatic. He built the gallows to hang Mordecai on. He got invited to a party by the king who was invited through Esther. He came that night ecstatic because he, the unrighteous, was going to see the righteous hung on the gallows. But in an instant, it turned around, and he was hung on the very gallows that he created. Do you know in France, they had the French Revolution, and the guy had been in the guillotine? Do you know what happened to him in the end? They turned on him, and he would die by the guillotine. And I can give you more and more stories like that. People that have invented things 
to bring destruction to godly people, and they have died by their own, by the same that by the thing that they created. Okay, so we pray for righteousness. We pray for righteousness to rule in our land. But if an enemy comes against you and has a plan against you, and you stand on the promise of God, if he digs a pit, you're gonna he's gonna fall into it, not you. If he has a plan that's going that he's going to plan out against you, it's going to backfire and it's going to happen to him. Amen. Okay, so you claim that. Now, as I said, we also have a shovel. Okay, so you can take your shovel and you can dig a pit for yourself, your own personal pit, or you can dig a pit for somebody else. So, how do you dig a pit for yourself? You be a Saul. Anybody know who Saul was? Not, not, not Paul Saul, but the other Saul. Saul of the Old Testament. How did he dig a pit for himself? God told him to do something. He didn't do it. Samuel comes along and says, why didn't you do it? He says, well, I wanted to, but they wouldn't let me. It's all their fault. I, I wanted to do the right thing, God, but... Uh, you know, my wife just wouldn't let me do it. Or my son wouldn't let me do it. Or my neighbor wouldn't let me do it. It's not my fault, God. And every time you say that, you just dig a little bit deeper, put on the shovel, okay, one more load. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's, you know, everybody else's fault. I knew a guy that would get tickets and get in wrecks on a pretty regular basis. And he'd, he'd always... Uh, he came to my church, he'd always say, you know, this person did this, did that. And he'd always get the ticket and be blamed for causing the accident. But he never caused the accident, and he didn't deserve the ticket. The other guy did. So you just dig it deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay? So you can dig a pit for yourself by blaming others for your actions. And I guarantee you the soil is going to be very soft and easy for you to dig into. Okay? Now I want to talk about one of your shovels, your lips. You can use your lips to dig holes or fill them. When we interact with people, our words are like the scoop of a shovel. They can dig and kill a relationship or fill a pit and bring a relationship back to life. Proverbs 11, 9. Corrupt words dig a hole. Godly words fill them. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only what is good and edifying for the moment. They can dig a pit of discouragement or a pit of encouragement, or fill a pit with encouragement. <coughs> Our lip shovel can solve, shove out goss gossip, or they can bury it. You know, the best way to stop gossip is don't listen, because you can't stop a gossip. If you don't ain't going to listen, you're going to find somebody that is. So the best way you can stop a gossip is not to listen. Now, I want to close with this, basically, in the next few minutes. Are you in a hole? I got three holes here. There's a lot of them out there that we dig for ourselves. One of them is, and I think it's the biggest, is a hole of shame. The things about this hole is that people jump in it to hide. You dig the hole, you jump in to hide. And you like to cover yourself up with the dirt of humiliation of, over your own guilt. There's little creatures inside the hole that whisper in your ear, stay down here for God won't forgive you, your sins. It's, you're too, it's too big. It's been too bad. God's not going to forgive you. People are not going to forgive you. You breathe in the dirty air, uh, dirty air of worthlessness, helplessness, and hopelessness. See, Adam and Eve, the very first couple, fell in the hole. How did they get out? God came, stuck his shovel into the hole. They took hold, and he pulled them out. Okay? He showed them mercy and grace by taking them out of the hole and filling it up. The Bible says Christ is our living hope, 1 Peter 1, 3, not our dead hope. So let him take you out of a pit of shame if you find yourself in one. 
Another hole we dig is the hole of fear. Peter fell into that hole. He told Christ he would never deny him, and he denied him three times. It only took him three scoops of the shovel to dig his hole. He fell in this hole, and there he laid. And it was quicksand, and it kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper, and he kept sinking more and more. It began to suffocate his faith. Worms of misery crawled all over him. In the hole, it paralyzed him and confused him, and it wouldn't let him speak out because he's fearful. But there is a way out. You take your lip shovel, you begin to fill up with words against fear, like the Lord is my strength in my life, whom shall I be afraid of? Speak the word. A lot of people believe in the Lord and they won't confess it because they're fearful. Okay, you work somewhere and people don't know you're a Christian because you're too fearful to let them know. The third hole is the hole of doubt. The hole of doubt is a mystery. It is an illusion. It's called the truth of God into question. God told us at the start of this year, if you remember, 2023, would be a year where the Lord will open the storehouse of heaven and his bounty and pour out rain on the land and the seasons will bless all the works of our hands. And if you listen to the news, all the good things the news says, that gas, by December, we are going to wish for $4 a gallon gas because of actions of our government that has shut down pipelines. They tell us, the truckers tell us that by, that by 2027, the supply chain of food will be pretty much devastated because there's all new regulations coming out for trucks that are going to cost a, a, a truck, which how much, is, how much does a semi cost? A couple hundred thousand? It's going to add forty to $50,000 to a price of a truck. And the truck will not have the performance it has now, and they will not be able to drive as many hours as they can right now. So the truckers are screaming that it's going to kill the supply chain. I can go on and on, listen to all that kind of stuff. Okay? You want to know about the power of God to do things? Just listen to the news and you can have a bunch of doubt about it, about what things are happening. We don't hear the good things that God does and God is doing. And as I said before, first of the year, if gas gets to five, six, seven dollars a gallon, doesn't matter because God is going to supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And that is what you stand on. Amen. I said at the first of the year, the Lord will open the storehouse of his bounty and pour rain onto our land and this season and bless all the works of our hands. Deuteronomy 28, 12. So if you lack confidence that God will do, that's called doubt. If you, ha if you believe what God said that's going to happen for toward the year 23, that is putting your faith and trust and listening to the news of the Lord. Whose report are you going to believe? No matter what pit you're in. Oh, okay. I was wondering where that come from. No matter what pit you're in. Jesus is a way out of the pit. God will redeem you from the pit and crown you with loving kindness and compassion. Psalms 103 verse 4. So if you're in a pit this morning, you claim that. God is going to deliver me from my pit. God is going to crown me with loving kindness and compassion. And once God does that, you take your shovel and you help him fill it in. And you start to declare, not that God will, Psalms 103, 4, you start to declare Psalms 40, verse 2. Okay? He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. Okay? In your walk through life, there are going to be demonic spirits and people who are going to dig holes in your path. 
Don't dig any holes yourself. They're going to dig holes in your path. You can pray for God to fill them or you can do what you're supposed to do as a child of God. You take your shovel and you fill the hole. Now it may slow down your walk while you're filling the hole, but you fill the hole by proclaiming and speaking the word of God. So I pray that, uh, I actually thought about, and I could have, but I didn't have time to get them here. You go on Amazon and buy anything. You can go on Amazon and buy these four inch shovels. Did you know that? But I didn't have time to get them. So, but I was going to hand everybody out a little shovel just to remind you, okay, that you have a shovel. Your words are shovels. Your action is shovels. So speak words that fill a hole. Don't speak words that dig one, especially over yourself. Amen? Would a prayer team come up? Thank you, Lord. If you're here this morning, I know we already came forward, but if you're here this morning and you sense in your spirit that there's a hole that needs to be filled and you just want somebody to pray for you and use a little bit of their words to encourage you and help you fill that hole, then I want you to come up and have him pray with you. But if you have a physical need, I want you to come up also. Any need you got, come up in the prayer team to pray for you. Amen. So let's all stand and we will close with a word of prayer. I like kind of leaning on a shovel. You know, shovels are good to lean on too, you know. <laughs> lean on God's shovel. Okay? Lean on God's shovel. Because you lean on, a, on your own shovel, you'll find it going into the dirt and not be there for you. So, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and you care for us. We thank you, Lord, that you come along and fill the holes that the enemy and other people dig in front of us. We thank you, Lord, for your shovel of love, your shovel of compassion, your shovel of forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, for all these things, and I pray blessing upon us, Lord, this week. And I pray, God, every time they see a shovel or use a shovel, they'll be reminded that you took us out of the pit, took us out of the miry clay, set our feet on solid ground so we could walk the path that's before us. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Chris?